this week we're going to start off with having a look at the history of Israel again. So, as I've already mentioned, last time we had a look at the history of Israel um, with the kings, and this time we want to focus on, on the prophets, um, which occurred within this time period we considered last time of the kings of Israel. And so last time we had a look at um, these um, four books here, the Kings and the Chronicles, and we gave a brief overview of the events which occurred within these two books. Um, and we're going to have a look again at that, that same time period. Um, but this time we're going to have a look at some of these prophets which occurred within this time period and have a brief look at what their message was. So we saw last time that um, the glory which King Solomon had, the power and the glory, the riches which he had during his reign, um, soon diminished after his son took over the kingdom and um, the ten northern tribes were taken away um, from Mirboam and from his sons, from, from their rule. And we, we said last time how that the kings of Israel um, were not all of the same family, they were not all of the same dynasty. Um, but rather there was much infighting and uh, the king, kings got overthrown um, a number of times during this time period. And we finished last time by saying that in 722 BC, after the end of, um, after the last king Hosea, God um, took away the kingdom of Israel and the, the kingdom of Israel went into captivity into Assyria. And what we'll have a look at next week is um, this time period here from um, this captivity down to the, um, the captivity of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And so we mentioned last time that the kingdom of Judah, the kings were a bit more faithful, they tried to follow God, um, or at least some of them tried to follow God. And so that kingdom lasted for a bit longer, that lasted for about um, 200 years longer than the, than the ten northern tribes. And we'll have a look at that. Look at that next week. Look at that particular time period. But tonight we're more con we're more considering these prophets which occurred within this time period, and look at their role within the history of Israel and um, within God's purpose. And so, um, first, if you can just come to um, two Chronicles chapter thirty six, um, we'll see what the role of the prophets was. Um, so that's um, if you're using um, these the Black Bibles, it's in, on page 477. Um, 2, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and if we just have a look at verse, um, verse 14, uh, verse 14 to 16, we read, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen, and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, so there was no remedy. And so verse 15 in particular, verse 15 and 16 in particular, tells us that God sent his messengers, his, um, his prophets, um, to the children of Israel. Um, and he sent warnings to them by his messengers. So he sent, and um, the prophets were used to send warnings to um, the people of Israel. And these warnings were the warnings of what was going to happen. We, um, we mentioned a few weeks ago, um, the role of prophecy and how that prophecy was um, foretelling something that was going to happen and um, foretelling God's word. Um, and so the prophets, prophets um, of God were foretelling what was going to happen um, to the children of Israel. And we saw that um, in verse 15 that God sent these messengers, these prophets, because he had compassion on them. And so God, God knew what was going to ha God, what was going to happen. God was working in the kingdoms of um, kingdoms of men. God was working at this time, um, and He was telling the people what was going to happen. And the reason for that was to give them the chance <coughs> to repent and to turn back to Him. 
because verse 14 tells us that the people had gone away from God and they were looking um, they were following other idols um, or other gods um, the idols of the nations around them and therefore because of this that the punishment would come upon them from God as we saw last time with Solomon where he went away from God and therefore a punishment came upon him and the kingdom was taken away from him. So the role of the prophet was to warn the children of Israel and um, the tribe of Judah what was going to happen. But verse, um, verse 16 we saw that they mocked the prophets and um, mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets. So they, they did not listen to, listen to the prophets. And so because of this, as, we, um, as we've mentioned already and as we'll have a look at next week, because of this, because they didn't listen to God's pro prophets, the captivity eventually um, came and they got, they got um, taken over by the, by, well, the Israelites got taken over by the Assyrians and um, the tribe of Judah got taken by the ba Babylonians. So that was the role of the prophets. So we just um, have a brief look at... Um, some of the prophets themselves and what their message was. So two of the key prophets to the tribe of Israel in particular um, were Amos and Hosea. Now Amos was a shepherd and that was his that was his job before he was called to be a prophet. Um, so he was a prophet um, to the tribe of Israel and he called um, well he pronounced judgment on the nation of Israel because of their luxurious lifestyles and their idolatry. And at this time they had completely turned their back on God. They were following the, um, the idols, the nations around. They were practicing um, many different rituals of the nations around, um, many which were very immoral. And so, and so um, Amos pronounces judgment on the children of Israel. So he tells them this judgment is going to come upon them. But at the same time, um, he also um, pleads with the people of Israel to repent um, from the things that they are doing and to turn, um, to turn back to God. And um, before we go any further, I'll just say that um, pages 41 to 46 in your workbooks um, give you more detail on, on these prophets, um, what their message is, um, and any key passages. So tonight we're just going to have a brief look, um, a brief overview at the, uh, some of the... Um, some of the prophets, but the workbook will give you a bit more detail. So that was Amos. Hosea was another um, prophet to the tribe of Israel, and his ministry began about ten years later than Amos. And he, instead of concentrating necessarily on the judgment that was going to happen, he concentrates on God's patience with the children of Israel, and how God was being um, long-suffering, he was willing to um, to wait for the people of Israel to turn to him and to repent if, it, if, they, if they were willing to. But he does emphasise that that punishment was going to come upon them if they um, continued to willfully go against God and to not follow him. And, and similarly, as there were important prophets to the tribe of Israel, there were also important prophets to the tribe of Judah. And two of these um, key ones were... Uh, the two below Amos Hosea, Micah and Isaiah. And these were contemporaries um, of each other, um, but slightly later than Hosea and Amos, and we, we've uh, briefly just had a look at. And Micah um, did a very similar job to that of Amos um, so, um, in pronouncing judgment um, that was going to come on the tribe of Judah instead of the tribe of Israel. And he also sh um, Give, paints a picture um, and prophesies about the future kingdom that um, that would come about and ultimately the establishment of God's kingdom um, in the future which again we've touched on before with, um, with Nebuchadnezzar's image and we can just see how there's a golden thread through scripture and how it all points to the same things, it all says the same consistent message um, ultimately being fulfilled in the establishment of God's kingdom. And Isaiah, um, another one we mentioned, was um, one of what's, what's classed as a major prophet, um, major in the size of, of the book um, which, they, um, which we have in the Bible, um, Isaiah being 66 chapters long, I think. Um, so his ministry lasted um, about 50 years um, and spanned the rule of four different kings. And again, he um, 
he prophesied of the establishment of God, God's kingdom, and also prophesied a lot about, um, about Jesus and about his birth um, and the role which, which he would fulfill. And um, interestingly, um, the book of Isaiah is one of the books um, which, which were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that was dated to 100 years before Christ. Um, so 100, 100 years BC, um, proving that the book of Isaiah was written before Christ, um, before Jesus was born and before he lived. And so these prophecies which we see in Isaiah, or which we can read about, um, were told before the events actually occurred. Um, yeah, so, so, we, so therefore the prophecies um, were foretelling something which was going to happen and not just recording something as, as it happened. And so as we, um, as we have a look down um, these, pro um, these prophets here, um, we'll see that most of them are in bold, um, apart from these two at the top, Elijah and Elisha. And these ones in bold are, book, um, are prophets which, we have, which have a book within the Bible. Um, so all these are books within the prophets um, we have in our Bible, whereas Elijah and Elisha don't have a book, but we read of their of their activities, of their prophecies, um, within the kings and the books of kings and the chronicles. And we've mentioned how that the prophet's role was to tell um, Israel and Judah about, um, about the things which were going to happen, about events which were going to which were going to come about. But the, also another role of the prophets was to tell the nations round about as well. Um, so if we look at Jonah and Nahum, they were two prophets which prophesied to the nations round about Israel and Judah. So that their message wasn't just to the children of Israel, but also to the nations around. And so God was given a very clear message to anyone who would listen, um, anyone who would listen to his word about what was going to happen. And that's the same for us today. God does, if we want, if we want to listen to him, does give us an indication of those things that are going to happen um, in the future. And we've already seen in two, chronicle, um, in two Chronicles how because the people didn't listen to these prophets, um, that the captivity then came and um, they, went, they, well, they were defeated in battle and were taken into captivity. And this happened for both Israel and for Judah. And as a result of this, um, they were spread um, throughout um, much of the, of the Middle East, and many other peoples um, um, were relocated to their land. Um, so one of the things which the king of Assyria did in particular, um, when Israel was taken into captivity, was relocate people once they were defeated. Um, of course, it makes it much harder to communicate and to um, rise up against people ruling over you if you can't understand the language of the people that you're dealing with on a daily basis. And so they relocated people um, to make people more confused and less likely to rise up against them. Um, and the result of this was that the worship of God, um, the worship of God um, by the Israel and Judah, became corrupted. Um, just we're going to turn to one passage. Um, if you come to 2 Kings chapter 17, um, which is on page 400, um, 400 of, these, of, the, of these Bibles. So 2 Kings chapter 17. Um, and we'll just have a look at two verses, verse 32 to 33. So the, the previous verses have explained how... the um, the king of Assyria moved different people into the land of Israel. And verse 32, So they feared the Lord, and made unto themselves of the lowest of them, priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord, and served their own gods, after the manner of the nations whom they carried away thence. Um, in fact, verse 34 as well, um, unto, this day, unto this day they do after the former ma matter, manners, they fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes, or after their ordinances, or after the law and commandment, which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So these people, they tried to follow God, because they, they were living in the land of Israel, they tried to follow the God of the land, as it were, they tried to follow um, the true God. But they also corrupted that worship, and tried to follow their own gods at the same time. 
um, and because of this they were no longer serving God in the way that he wanted them to, um, as verse 34, um, th 34 and 35 um, explains. And that, um, that sets up the, um, some of the history which we see, we'll see next time in the next seminar um, with Hezekiah and the work that he did to try and bring about a pure, um, a pure religion, a, um, a religion which was focused on God rather than all these, these other gods of the nations around as well. And uh, so the next time, um, next, next seminar, which is two weeks' time, we'll have a look at the history of, from Hezekiah onwards and how um, this false worship, this um, corruption which had come into, um, into the worship of God had an effect on the nation of Judah as well as the nation of Israel. So that's a brief overview of um, the history of Israel, um, and particularly the, pro the role of the prophets um, during this time. Um, and I'll now hand over to Mark for um, cross-references. So we, at the start of um, the uh, seminars, we looked at what we called Bible Echo. So if you remember, we looked at the example with Jesus on the cross when he said, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we said that that was a Bible Echo back to Psalm 22. And actually we find in that Psalm loads of information about what happened to Jesus. Uh, on the cross. Now, you might have thought, well, it's all well and good looking for um, Bible echoes, um, but the Bible's a big book. Um, there's nearly a million words uh, in the Bible. It's a big book to read, and if you're anything like me, uh, you forget things. Uh, so how do you remember, and how can you make all of those links, those Bible echoes, um, in, the, in the scriptures? So that's where cross-references um, come in because uh, there are people that have uh, gone through the Bible, that have looked at all the links and uh, helpfully done notes for us to try and link the Bible together. Okay, So when we're talking about cross-references, they're, they're linking words, uh, they're linking phrases, linking places, linking um, ideas and this section is to give us some tools and perhaps do a bit of practical work as well to keep us awake on this uh, warm evening. Um, and uh, to give us some tools as to as to how to how to do that. So, um, the use of, of cross references. I think there's four main areas where they are of use. Um, they can link um, teachings or prophecies between the Old and the New Testaments. Okay, so uh, like the echo, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a great link between what Jesus is saying in the New Testament straight back um, into the Old. Um, it can also help us expand our knowledge of being a person uh, or a place or a subject and we can look at some examples of that so um, if we were doing a study on let's say one of the prophets Jonah and we wanted to find out um, everything about Jonah we might use cross references to see uh, where else in the Bible Jonah's mentioned other than uh, his book for example. A uh, third way is to look at parallel accounts, um, because what we do find in the Bible that there are certain sections of the Bible that, that repeats itself, or apparently repeats itself, but actually what it usually does, it gives additional details on the same subject. So the four Gospels are an excellent example of that. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John give an account of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, many of them record the sayings of Jesus, but they all give it from a slightly different perspective. So if we're reading in Matthew's Gospel and we're reading one of the parables and we want to find out what the same parable in Luke is or in Mark, again, cross-references uh, help us. And uh, Kings and Chronicles also are two books uh, where that is relevant. And um, it also helps us, as our final sort of strand, um, clarify the meaning of passages. So. We said last week that the Bible very much interprets itself. So if we're struggling to understand a passage, often other passages in the Bible will give us that meaning. And again, um, that's where uh, cross-references come into play. Okay, so how do we use um, our cross-references? Well, last week, uh, John uh, spent a bit of time with the concordances, and I brought some concordances in uh, with us and concordances are really good at telling us where the same word occurs elsewhere in the bible okay so i've got a credence concordance here and a strong's concordance and then if you want to find out the meaning of the word um, then we could use a lexicon 
this is Jusenius, um, which is the Hebrew lexicon, and we've also got Thais here tonight, which is the Greek lexicon to give us the meaning of the word in Strongstus and Eximila. Now, cross references, sometimes you can just look at the word, and therefore a concordance is helpful, um, but there are other aids that we can use. Now, um, a lot of Bibles have a centre margin and looking around the room I think some have got centre margins. Um, this one that we've been handing out uh, doesn't have a centre margin so I have brought a couple uh, Bibles with um, centre margins. Do you want to I'll give you that one Daniel just for this evening. Um, this one with the centre margin I think there's a couple at the back there. Um, so what the centre margin does is um, it links together from the verses, the cross references. So the cross references are down the middle of the of the centre margin. Now some Bibles, um, and the NIV study Bible sort of does this, I couldn't find <laughs> another example. Uh, some Bibles have the cross references of footnotes um, at, the, at the bottom. So you can either have a centre spine um, with the cross references, or sometimes it's, uh, it's footnotes. So perhaps we can pass that one to the girls at the back. <laughs> haven't seen the, uh, the footnote uh, version. Or the other way that we can do this um, is that we can use um, a dedicated book which has got the cross references in and uh, the classic book to use is the Treasury of Scripture uh, Knowledge. Now I don't have um, that um, in a book form but I do have it electronically and um, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen and see how that works. A little bit later on. Okay, so that's um, that's what cross references are. Let's let's use um, let's use some examples of cross references, and uh, we're going to do a couple of examples together now. Um, then Peter's got a further section to do, and if we've got time at the end, we'll go through some of the worked sections in the uh, in the workbook because I, I think some of these cross references are, are really interesting. Okay, um, let's go to Romans chapter 9 in the New Testament. Uh, so, Romans, I'll tell you the page number in a tick. Romans chapter 9 is on page 1037. And uh, we're going to read um, from verse... Uh, 27 of Isaiah of uh, Romans uh, chapter 9. And we'll go a bit further down, sorry, no, not page, not verse, um, sorry, we want to go a little bit further up rather. There we go. Uh, verse 24 is where we want to start. So Romans chapter 9, verse 24 says, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, okay, so this is Paul um, telling the uh, people in Rome that God's purpose is now not just to the Jews, but it's also to the Gentiles, and he gives proof of this, he says in verse 25, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not um, beloved. Now, you'll see... Um, here in the footnotes, so this is one with the, uh, the footnotes, that um, Paul says that he's quoting from uh, Hosea, he says also in Hosea, and um, the footnotes give us the quote, so the cross references give us the quote, which is from the prophecy of Hosea and chapter 2. So let's go to the prophecy of Hosea and chapter 2. And Hosea is quite a tricky book to find. Um, it's after the book of Daniel, and the page number is, I should have written these down before, 826. Uh, so Hosea chapter 2, and um, verse 22 for connection. So Hosea chapter 2, verse 22 says, And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Verse 23, I will sow her unto me in the earth. I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. 
I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. And that's quite a remarkable passage when you think about it, because as Peter explained earlier, um, Hosea the prophet um, was uh, telling Israel, God's people, God's chosen people, to repent, to turn back to him. And Hosea prophesied that there would be a people that would turn to God, which were not called God's people. So in other words, uh, the Gentiles. And so when Paul and the other apostles, um, the followers of Jesus, started preaching uh, the gospel, uh, the good news to the Gentiles, it was rooted very much in the Old Testament. It was a prophecy um, that this would happen. And we only really pick that up by looking at the cross references. Okay, so that's, um, and, uh, that's if we used an online Bible and perhaps uh, look at that a little bit later. Um, okay, so we're going to look at another one now. Um, so let's go to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 1. I think we've briefly touched on this one before. So this is when the angel Gabriel um, comes to Mary the mother of Jesus, and says that she's going to have a child um, that was going to be the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and Gabriel says in Luke chapter 1, and this is page 932, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, this is what Gabriel says to, to, Jesus, uh, to Mary, verse 31 for connection, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Verse 32, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of of his father David. Now, if you look at your centre references, um, there are various quotes next to it. So, the first one, he will be great. Uh, you might have a quote link to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. Now, Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 is where Jesus was baptised and um, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, comes upon Jesus. And God says to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So uh, Jesus was indeed great. He was called the son of the uh, son of God. And God was pleased with him. He will be called the son of the highest. So that's one cross reference. Um, we've then got another one here to the throne of his father, David. And uh, down here. Uh, we've got two quotations, um, we've got 2 Samuel chapter 7, and then we've also got uh, Matthew uh, chapter 1. Well, let's go back into the Old Testament first of all, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel 7 uh, is page 324. And um, this is what David was saying to Solomon, his son. So this is right at the start of the establishment of the kings of Israel. And um, what is said here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and uh, verse, verse 12. When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So this was somebody that was going to come after uh, King Solomon. It says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Um, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. And what this prophecy is, is pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was taking on the throne of his father, um, David. And... Um, God would be his son, is what this verse is referring to. And the other cross-reference that we've got here is to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 1. So right at the start of the Gospels, uh, what does it emphasise for us? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And if we were writing... Um, the Gospels, would we start it like this? I suspect we wouldn't. Um, but this is how it's emphasised for us in the Bible. Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. And then in Matthew chapter 1, we've got the genealogy of, um, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was of the lineage of King David, so he could claim the throne of David. So we can link all those passages together by using our uh, marginal references in the, in the centre. So um, that, that's a good example of linking teachings or prophecies between Old and, and New Testaments. Now, um, we're going to look at one now which is going to connect our knowledge of persons, places or subjects. Okay, and I think this is, this is quite an interesting uh, one. It's an, an episode um, from the ministry of Jesus and it's in uh, the Gospel of John and the fourth chapter. Okay, so if we can go to uh, John chapter 4, it's up on the screen as well. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Um, I know we're turning up lots of passages now, but uh, it is the cross-referencing section, so, uh, um, so that's why we're doing that. Uh, so John chapter 4, um, Jesus is in the area of Samaria. Now Samaria was the north part of Israel. Um, it's where uh, the ten tribes were located, and much of this area had fallen into apostasy, as it were, that they'd mixed their religions um, because of the infiltration of the nations around, as Peter mentioned earlier. And he comes across a woman, and uh, let's pick it up in verse 4 of John chapter 4, so this is page 971. Verse 4 of John 4, And he, that's Jesus, must needs go through Samaria, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore being warned with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And this woman comes up to him, and Jesus has a discourse with this woman about um, her way of life and also the things that uh, she should be believing in. Now, we're not going to get into too much of the detail of, of what happened uh, with this woman, but what we want to look at is um, the links um, between this place here, Sychar in the New Testament, and this reference to that it's near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son uh, Joseph. Now, Sychar in the New Testament is better known in the Bible as Shechem. And if we were to get a concordance out, that would make that clear. And if we were to um, get a, a Bible atlas out, and you might have a Bible atlas in the back of your Bible, some of you, uh, Shechem um, is right in the middle of, of Israel um, there, quite close to um, quite a famous mountain in Israel called Mount Gerizim. So that's where Jesus was located. But it's making us think back to the Old Testament. So it was a place called Shechem near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And the, quote, the cross-reference that we've got is back to Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19. So let's go back there. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 33 and uh, let's see where um, that incident occurs. Genesis chapter 33, and remember that Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And um, in Genesis chapter 33 and uh, verse uh, 18, so this is page 44, uh, Genesis 33 verse 18, and Jacob came to Shalem, and the word Shalem means peace, okay, so Jacob came, it actually should be better translated, Jacob came in peace to a city, Shechem, so the same place that Jesus is in Sychar, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city, and he brought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. See, when the, um, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob came into the land of Israel, they didn't own any of the land of Israel. God had promised it to them, um, but none of it actually belonged uh, to them. So uh, Jacob uh, buys this, um, this parcel of land, this same parcel of land that Jesus is um, talking to this woman of Samaria on. 
Now that in itself um, perhaps doesn't seem that um, remarkable, um, but John chapter 4 gave us another cross-reference to uh, Shechem, this parcel of land that Jacob bought, and that other cross-reference is in Joshua and chapter 24. So let's go to Joshua 24. So if we were piecing all these together, we get the whole story. Uh, Joshua chapter 24, and that's on page uh, 253. So Joshua chapter 24, Jacob had bought this, this piece of land, and then in Joshua chapter 24, um, hundreds of years later, we're given this detail. Uh, verse 32 of Joshua 24, and the bones of Joseph, and Joseph was uh, one of the sons of Jacob, of course. Joseph was the one that went down into Egypt um, and that became very prominent in Egypt and uh, saved his brothers um, out of Egypt. Verse 32, the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So Joseph died many years before. Um, Israel had been on their one wilderness wanderings. They come back into the land of Israel. They go back to the same place that Jacob had bought this piece of land, and they bury Joseph there. And the man that's doing this, the man that's bringing Jacob's, uh, Joseph's uh, bones back, um, is uh, <laughs> Joshua. Now, if we were to get a concordance out um, and look at what Jesus' name means, I think we've perhaps touched on this briefly before, uh, Jesus' name means uh, Jehovah is salvation or the Lord is salvation, the Lord's saviour. Okay, that's what Jesus' name means. And it's interesting that Joshua's name in the Old Testament means exactly the same. Joshua means Jehovah or the Lord is salvation. In fact, Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. So just as Joshua saved his people by bringing them into the promised land, so Jesus was going to do the same thing as well. So in this chapter, in Joshua chapter 24, where <coughs> Joshua brings Jake, uh, Joseph's bones, buries them in Shechem, what Joseph, uh, Joshua had actually been doing here is they'd been instructing Israel in what they should and what they shouldn't do before God. And he says to Israel in verse 14 of Joshua chapter 24, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Okay, so... Joshua, whose name means the same as Jesus, fear the Lord, serve him with sincerity um, and uh, in truth. So let's pick up this word here, serve in sincerity and in truth. Israelites were to put away their false worship and return to the true worship of God. So let's complete the circle then. Let's go back to John chapter 4. And we'll see why cross-references can be so interesting. Uh, John chapter 4, um, because Jesus quotes the same thing. John chapter 4, when he's talking to this woman of Samaria, um, we need to go down to 2. Joshua cha uh, John chapter 4, verse 22. It says, this is Jesus talking to the woman of Samaria. You worship, you know not what... We know what we worship for salvation is the Jews. So this woman of Samaria was worshipping all sorts of things, a bit like Joshua was telling the people not to do. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father says such to worship him. And uh, what we actually find is that uh, the word spirit is better rendered as sincerity. <laughs> So what Jesus is actually doing, he's quoting back to Joshua. He's giving this woman of Samaria uh, the same uh, talk, as it were, that Joshua gave to um, the people to worship God in spirit and in truth, in sincerity and in truth. There's only one way uh, to worship God. 
So we get a much greater feel of the richness of the Bible uh, when we look at um, all these uh, these cross references. And if we've got time at the end, we'll look at some more. We may be struggling. It now is God's manifestation, and uh, specifically, we're going to have a look at um, the name the name of, of God. So if we start, if you can come to um, Psalm and Psalm 110. Um, we'll start off there. So in Psalm, um, sorry, Psalm 110 is on page 591. So Psalm 110, and the first, the first verse, we read, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And we start off here for a particular reason, because in this verse, um, if we look closely at our Bibles, we see that the word Lord um, appears twice in the first sentence. But we notice something different between the two words. And that's the first Lord is in, is in capital letters, um, whereas the second Lord isn't. And we want to have particularly have a look at what um, that first word Lord means in the original Hebrew. Because God is referred to as Lord um, throughout the Bible on numerous different occasions. Um, we just need to have a look at the first verse of the next three Psalms. Um, so Psalm 111 um, starts with, Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Psalm 112 again starts with, Praise ye the Lord. And we could keep going on. There's many different occurrences of, um, the, of God being referred to as Lord um, within the Bible. And so we need to have a look at, at what it means. Why is it in capital letters? Well, in the Hebrew, um, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, we, if we have a look at a concordance or a lexicon, um, and we have a look at the background to it, we can see that the word Lord um, in capitals isn't just um, the word Lord as we would necessarily understand it, um, but it's actually a proper name. It's, it's the, the memorial name of God. So it's actually God's name, the name by which um, God reveals himself um, to, um, to men and women in, in the Bible. And the Jews had a, um, a, tradi had a tradition um, because of the, one of the commandments of God, that they were not able to take the, the, name, of the name of the Lord in vain. Um, they had a tradition that when they copied out the scriptures, when they, um, when they read the scriptures, they would replace God's memorial name um, with the word Adonai in, in, uh, in the Hebrew language, um, or translated into English, the word Lord. Uh, and they would do that to make sure that they didn't take um, the name of God in vain. And so, yes, yeah, so this substitution obviously made it almost impossible to um, read the word of God and inadvertently take the word of God, in, um, the name of God in vain. Um, that was as a result of one of their traditions. But, the, um, but it's been translated uh, in... Um, or written down as capital letters, um, to inform us that it is, um, it is a name rather than just the word Lord. So whenever we see that um, the word Lord in capital letters, um, we know, you know, we can understand that is um, the name of God. And in the Hebrew, that um, name is Yahweh. Um, you can see on the screen um, the letters by which that's formed, um, and it's, it's pronounced Yahweh, so Y-H-W-H. And um, Mark's already um, partially alluded to it, but that's also, um, it's also um, pronounced um, Jehovah in, a, in, in, in um, I think that's a Latin translation, I think. Um, so, so whenever you see Yahweh or Jehovah, um, that is the same, the same word. Um, and so why is um, this proper, why is this name used so many times um, throughout the Bible? Um, so, got that bit. so, names are very important within the Bible. Um, Mark, again, has already had a look at um, the name of Jesus and how Jesus means Yah saves. Um, we can think of the word Hallelujah, which um, literally means praise Yah or praise God. Um, there's many different words in the Bible which have, um, or particularly names of individuals, um, which have the word Yah in them. Um, and that helps us understand their meaning and um, helps us to understand a bit about the character themselves because the name represents something about the character. 
and the name represents something, doesn't it? We use names in, in um, modern language to represent something which, um, rather than describing it in great detail, we use a name um, so that everyone can understand. And so in this name, um, in this name Yahweh, um, translated throughout the Bible, God is revealing um, his character, um, his, or revealing himself to us, and he's manifesting um, himself um, to us and to those he came into contact with. So if you come to Exodus um, chapter 3, uh, as an example of this, So Exodus chapter 3, um, and the first couple of verses, um, page 65, read, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with a fire, and the bush was not consumed. And so, on first reading, it seems that Moses is um, speaking to God, or God speaking to Moses. Um, but we see verse 2, that it's the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, the angel of Yahweh, is speaking, um, is speaking to Moses. And um, Moses then goes on in verse 13, um, toward the end of this conversation. Um, so verse 13, Moses... <coughs> Um, so, sorry, a bit of context. So when this is when God is speaking to Moses to tell him to go to the children of Israel in Egypt. Um, so he's been asked to go and speak to God's people, um, the people of Israel. And in verse 13, um, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? So Moses asks, saying, what shall I say your name is? When I go to the children of Israel, as you've asked me to do, who do I say you are? And God's response in um, verse 14 is, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. And but notice there again, that in that verse, um, the phrase I am that I am is again in capital letters. It's all in capital letters, similarly, um, similar to the word Lord, as we see elsewhere, is in capital letters. When that refers to, to Yahweh, when that refers to the name of God, this is also all in capital letters. And once again, this is referring to the name of God. And this is where, um, where a lexicon um, can help us to understand the, the meaning of, of this word Yahweh. Because if we have a look at the meaning of the word Yahweh, um, the lexicon would tell us that it's a word which has a continuous tense. Um, so you, you obviously understand that most words have like a past tense or present tense or future tense. But this word, this word, word Yahweh has a continuous tense, which means it's ongoing. Um, so, so it has been happening, it is happening, and will continue to happen. It's that continuous tense. Um, so it's past, present, and future, all, all at once. Um, and so um, this, this word Yahweh, this phrase, I am that I am, um, in, 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 if we translate it into English, um, or if we literally translate it into English, um, it literally translates almost as I am becoming what I will become. It's kind of a continuous tense. Um, I am what I am, and I am becoming what I, um, what I will become. And so this word Yahweh, which God is um, revealing himself um, or how God is revealing himself to, to Moses at this particular time and elsewhere in the Bible, tells us about the character of, of God and the, um, and the characteristics uh, of God and how he is from everlasting to everlasting. Because um, that's not something we can necessarily get our head around, is it? So it's something that we've got to have a representation of um, in this name, um, being from ever to ever. Um, so not, not having a no be any... In not having a beginning or an end isn't something we can really understand. And so this is in a um, representation um, in the memorial name of God, of the character of God. And if we look at verse um, 15 of Exodus chapter 3, um, verse 15, God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, 
The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So we go to say it. This is his, his name forever. This, um, this is his everlasting name, this memorial um, name, which, um, which he refers to here. And if we just come over a couple of chapters to Exodus chapter 6, um, just as a, another example where um, we see the, the name of God, um, Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3, um, God speaking to Moses again, um, verse 2 says, I am the Lord, again the word the Lord there is in capital letters, referring to the name of God Yahweh, and verse 3, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, and again that's the same word as, as the word Lord, the word Yahweh, um, was I not known to them. So we see that there's, a, there's different translations in the Bible, you've got Yahweh, you've got Lord, um, you've got um, I am that I am, they're all shown in capital letters to indicate that it's the name of God, um, it's the name of, of Yahweh, and it's revealing himself through this um, through this word, he's manifesting himself through this word um, to to us um, and to and to Moses in this instance that we've looked at. Um, so that's a that's a brief look at um, God's manifestation, how he reveals his name um, name to us. And so I'll hand back over to Mark. Okay, thanks, Peter. Okay, so very quick recap then um, on uh, on what we've uh, what we've looked at. Um, we started off uh, by looking at the uh, section of the history of Israel, we looked at the prophets, and uh, the prophets there were to warn uh, the people, uh, to warn Israel where they uh, were going wrong, where they were going away from God, and the consequences of what would happen if they continued on that same uh, line of track. And then uh, we looked at um, some cross-references and the reasons uh, why we would uh, why we do that, and then uh, Peter's uh, finished with uh, with God manifestation. Now, uh, before we go tonight, um, I'd like you to turn to your workbooks if you can, please. Um, page forty-five. So it's section section seventeen, uh, using uh, cross-references um, because. Sadly, we're not going to have a, uh, a seminar uh, next week because of the bank holiday and half term. So we'll be starting again in two weeks' time, and uh, you'll be pleased to know you're halfway through the course now. Uh, so we've got another five weeks to go after uh, after half term, and I think I meant to check this. I think we're back at the amber coat. Um, yeah. <laughs> so assume the assume the amber coat. Um, but in the two weeks uh, break that we have, um, something you might like to do is to work through um, page 45 and 46 of your workbook and um, look at some of these uh, cross-references. So, for example, and just to conclude, um, let's have a look at one more uh, cross-reference. Let's have a look at um, Luke's Gospel and chapter 4. So in Luke chapter 4, I'll do it in this Bible so we get the uh, page numbers. And again, this just shows, just to highlight the importance of comparing different bits of the Bible with the other bits of the Bible. Luke chapter 4, so it's page 936, and uh, it's down at verse um, 16. And it says that he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And the custom of the Jews was that every Sabbath they'd read a different portion um, of the Old Testament. And it was allotted on different days which portion uh, you would uh, read. And Jesus is asked uh, on this particular Sabbath uh, to do the reading. And uh, it says in verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he gets the scroll out and he starts reading. Verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book 
and gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all of them who were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Okay, so it's very, something very dramatic about Jesus read this passage and then it says he closed the book. He always makes a big thing of, of closing the book. Now, why does he do that? Well, in our notes, and if you've got a cross-reference margin or if you look it up on Treasury of Scripture Knowledge or something similar, um, it takes us back to Isaiah chapter 61. So let's go back to Isaiah 61. Keep a marker in Luke 4 because you'll see the difference. Isaiah chapter 61, this must have been the chapter that Jesus uh, was reading. So verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And the Jews that Jesus was reading this to would have been familiar with this chapter. And Jesus is saying, look, this is talking about me, this verse, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. And good tidings is the gospel message, the good news of God's coming kingdom. Unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in Luke, it tells us it was that point that he closed the book, that he stopped reading. But Isaiah's prophecy doesn't stop there, does it? It goes on, it says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And we need to ask the question, well, why did he stop at that point? Why did he stop at, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord? Why didn't he go on to say the day of vengeance of our God and the conclusion of uh, thinking on that is that Jesus' first ministry wasn't the day of vengeance of God that was something that was going to come in the future at Jesus' second uh, coming and there's lots of prophecies uh, that talk about that so by linking the scriptures we get these extra details and you might like to work your way through um, the different cross section um, cross reference sections rather in, in, this, uh, in this workbook so that you'd find it interesting uh, doing that.